from coast to coast and around the world, it's time to praise the Lord. on Praise the Lord from the vacation capital of the world, exciting Central Florida, as we bring you anointed pastors, evangelists, teachers, authors, and other special guests with testimonies and teachings and music to glorify God as we lift up Jesus Christ as Lord. Welcome to Praise the Lord. We are so glad that you're with us today. I'm Pat McGuffin, and I'm looking forward to spending some time talking with a great young pastor from Kentucky that you're going to enjoy visiting with. So we're glad that you're here. We know that many of you tune in for your own reasons, things that are going on in your heart, things that are going on in your life, and you're looking for answers. Well, today, as we get together, I hope you'll find that one or two nuggets that you're looking for to take your life forward in Jesus Christ. So let's pray. Father, I thank you for this incredible day. I thank you for your goodness, that you are the God of answers, that you are the God who hears us. And so we bless you from the bottoms of our heart, and we look forward to all that you have for us this day in Jesus Christ, your Son, our Savior. Amen. Well, as we tune in now to a song, I just encourage you to worship with us with this song. When I thought you'd forgot You picked me up once again When I was at my very end You poured the oil way down deep For all those bitter tears I've weeped Now my life is filled with joy My hope will never be destroyed you turned my crying into laughter. You put a smile in its place. You took tears I'd cried for many years, and you wiped them from my face. And all the sadness that I'd felt from the very start, you and all. Could heal my broken heart. Now days are filled with sunshine. That old darkness had to go. There's no place for fear and doubt. Satan's a defeated foe. More than a conqueror, you've made of me. And I'm going forth in victory And I'm taking back what Satan stole He must return it sevenfold You turned my crying into laughter You put a smile in its place You took tears I cried for many years And you wiped them from
Well, welcome back. We're so glad that you're here with us again on Praise the Lord. And today we have an incredible opportunity to get with a young pastor from Kentucky who's going to share his heart about what God's put on his heart, not only in the building of his church, which he is more interested in promoting the gospel than building a church. And we're going to get into that in just a second. But please welcome with me Pastor Blake Reynolds. Blake, thanks so much for being with us. Hi, it's good to be here. Uh, tell us a little bit about your journey on how you got into the pastorate. Well, um, I, uh, I've, I feel like I've always been called into the ministry, even at a young age, just had different people just speak into my life in, in that area. And uh, so when I was 12, I, I kind of I kind of strayed off from because I, I was raised in the church. I always thought it was going to be cool to follow in my dad's footsteps to be a preacher and and all that good stuff. My grandpa, it was, just, it was just normal. It was normal to want to be a preacher. I didn't want to be an astronaut. I didn't want to be a famous baseball player. I just kind of wanted to be a preacher. And uh, I think at 12, I just kind of steered off from that path. And then coming back around 20, I just felt like God said, you know what, like, Blake, I'm, I, I want to use you. And uh, this is what I need you to do. So around 20 years old, um, surrendered my life back to Christ and said, okay, God, I want to be used by you. And then, and then I started, um, I, I just, God, whatever it is, whether it's cleaning the toilets at church or whether it's working the, the sound booth, whatever you want me to do, I'll do it. And so we just kind of started serving and, and God just began to prepare my heart for what was coming and what was coming. And so we, me and my wife, we did children's ministry mm -hmm. and uh, teaching the children and then bumped up to started helping with the youth ministry. And then, I mean, just God was just completely uh, or getting us ready for what was coming. And then, uh, then he told us to launch a church, to plant a church. So we did, and it's been three years. In August, it'll be three years, and uh, it has been a whirlwind of experience. So I bet uh, it has. I bet it has. Yeah. So, so really, you think that um, what catapulted you forward was serving others and serving yeah. the church that you're in and then seeing where God takes you from there. Yeah, I, I really don't know how you could have a heart to serve people and not eventually go that direction um, for, for somebody that God's using in that, in that, in that five-fold ministry, I guess, if it will. Um, I know some people go off and do missions work, but if you have a heart to serve people and God's called you to missions, I don't know how you're going to keep from it. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if God's called you to, to the fivefold ministry and pastoring and, and different things and you have a heart to serve people, I don't know. I don't know how you can keep from going that direction. And I think for me, as much as I really didn't want the responsibility and the stress of being a pastor, I, I remember when somebody looked at me and said, you're going to pastor this church. And I said, no, I'm not. And they said, yeah, you are. And, I, I, and in my mind, I was going, there's no way I want to be a pastor. Like, it just, it just seems way too stressful. It seems, uh, it seems too hard. Like, I'll preach. Let me preach all day long. I can, I can come up with a sermon. I can preach tomorrow. But pastoring, man, that, that just seems like a whole different ball game. And, and it has been. And, and we've just really gotten a team of people around us to kind of help with the administrative aspect of, of planning a church. And that way, me and my wife really get to take care of the the heart aspect and really just get to focus on people uh, because I'm, I'm telling you what, just pastoring, um, there's a lot of church to focus on, you know, just the building and the mm -hmm. little things like raising money here or spending money there. And, and for me, I'm just like, that, that's when my head starts to explode. And I'm like, oh, I, I just want to call my dad, you know, like, yeah. like, <laughs> like, come on, you do this. And let me just let me just speak to people. Let me meet with people. Let me talk to people. Let me just do leadership meetings. Like let, let's just cast vision. So um, we're still learning. We're three years into it. We're still young, and um, and we're learning. But I remember sitting down with a group of people. There's five families, and I told them, I said we're going to have 300 people in one year, in a in a town of 1,200 people, um, in a in a county of 15,000. So we're going to have 300 people in one year. Everybody thought I was nuts. I thought I was nuts, but I just, you know, I just, I felt like this is what God was saying. And, and sure enough, on our one-year anniversary service, we had 330 people in the building mm. uh, for church. And, um, and I believe that, I believe that God, he's not, he's not weak on his promises. And, uh, and he's definitely not weak on fulfilling those promises on, on his end of the deal. And he says, you know, this is what it could be. And, and I'm going to do my part. I want you to do your part. And um, so we, just as strong as he is, we come in just as strong. Okay, we're going to do our part with everything that we got in us. You know, even if it costs me sleep, 
if it cost me friendships, if it, you know, for the last three years, every Saturday, my every Saturday for the last three years has been in a, in a church studying. You know, I, I don't want to go into Sunday morning without studying the night before, so I don't go out, I don't do certain things, and I don't go to movies, I don't hang out at friends' houses, and that's Saturday night. That's the night that you get to do all those stuff because um, the rest of the world that work nine to five jobs that's not in a, at a church, well, their work days are Monday through Saturday, you know, and mine's Sunday. And um, so here I am on a Saturday night while they're inviting me to hang out. I, no, I, I, got, I got to stay put. I got to study. I got, I got to put my work in. <clears throat> Sorry. But I, I think that I think that as much as we put our work in and keep working and keep working and keep working, God's going to show up and do his part. And that's what I love about it because I keep seeing God Show them, do his part. So um, you had mentioned about a team around you, people mm-hmm. that you're building is giving them opportunity to serve mm-hmm. and at the same time investing in them. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, so that's a key component of what you're trying to do at your church? Definitely it has to be. You know, when Jesus was here with the disciples, he spent three years with them and then turned around and left this big world of church to them. Like, just this is Christianity I'm putting in your hands. I need you to go um, spread the gospel. I want you to baptize people. I want you to tell people about me. I want you to teach them what I've taught you. Uh, you spent three years with them. And, and we know that even at the end of the three years, they didn't have it all together. But Jesus invested a lot of time, and he discipled them in, in such a way that they were willing to, when they finally got what he was saying, they were like, oh, we know what to do. You know, like we, we, I, I don't know how they knew what to do because it didn't look like they knew what to do, even up to in, in the three years. But all of a sudden when it just clicked for them, and, and I think with people, the more you spend time with people, that don't mean they always get it right. That don't mean they're always going to do things the way that you do. But when it clicks for them, it's there. And I remember me and my wife, we just spent so much time in, in leadership training. That doesn't mean it was there. You know, all, we got a certificate at the end of a class, but it doesn't mean that we were prepared for it. But when we got it, it clicked. And so that's why we spend so much time with people. You know, I don't get mad at people when they're not doing things that I'm doing. I don't get mad at people if they can't do it exactly the way that I want them to. I just know that if I keep giving it to them, one day it'll click, and then it'll just, it'll just be like a, a second language that, man, I know, I know how to do what I'm doing. So we spend time with people on that end. Um, we want to replicate who we are. You know, I, I don't know that you could really say that you're good at what you do unless you can reproduce who you are. Yes. So we're constantly just trying to reproduce what God's doing in you. Yeah. Uh, the name of your church is One Church. Yes, sir. Um, why that name? What do you? What's it, what's critical about that name? Well, we were just um, the whole the whole thing behind this name. We really it, it's kind of funny how it all happened, but we had to come up with something really quick. We had to we had to come up with a church name because we had to have a bank account set up. We had to get out because when people People were going to be paying tithes. We needed to make sure that we were legit from the beginning. So we were all sitting in a room and we were trying to come up with names. And we had about 50 names tossed out there. And one church was tossed out there because the church that we were originally part of, um, that, that whole concept and idea kind of just fell through. It was called His Church. We really liked, the, we really liked that name. So we were like, man, what, what, what's even kind of close? And we were like, just one church. You know, we're... We come together and we're one body, you know, in one accord. And, and we just started looking at all the ones, you know, in Scripture and just like, man, I think God's called us to just be one church, you know. And we here we are. We're trying to break the denominational walls. We're trying to win people back into the, into the kingdom. And, and we were like, man, I think we'll just we'll call it one church because, you know, we to the togetherness, the oneness. And, and we, I mean, we had probably 50 reasons why one church was probably the, um, the name for the church, but I think most of all, from it, for all of us, it was we were, that was sitting in the room. We were just like that. That kind of sounds good. Now you said that um, one of your one of your goals was to reach out to people that somehow got disenfranchised with church. They've mm-hmm. been burned by a church experience in the past. Um, certainly, you want to reach them with uh, the gospel if they'd never heard the gospel. But you were also interested in people that somehow um, were disappointed along the way and that that disappointment has welled up in them and kept them out of serving alongside others yeah. in their walk with the Lord. Um, tell us a little more about that. See what we found with people that are kind of disenfranchised from church um, really they're not mad at the gospel they're not really that mad at Jesus. Now you have some you know death in the family they're blaming God or uh, different reasons that people blame God um, but I think most of the disenfranchised people are the ones that are 
Uh, they're tired of the church. They're tired of what we hear the most. Uh, people that come to us, man, are you just like all these other churches? Are you just like this? And, and really the, the question that we didn't even understand when we first started hearing that question, I'm like, I like the church. I like the church a whole lot. But what we found is, is uh, there's a lot of churches that run their churches pretty law-like. And, yes. and, and it's, it's causing people to leave. And, and you hear it all the time, especially in bigger cities, that my generation is just leaving church like crazy because of the rules and the regulations for church. And I'm sitting here like, I, I like church and I, and I happen to really like Jesus and um, I have a relationship with him. And, and what I was finding is these people weren't. They were, all they were getting is the do's and the don'ts of Christianity. And basically they were getting religion thrown at them. And here I am with the relationship with Jesus. And I was like, man, if they only, if they were to just tap into that part of Jesus, they would never leave the church disenfranchised or they would never leave the church angry because they have that relationship with Jesus. So we've just kind of gone out and we've just, we've really, the people that have left churches and people that are tired of church, people who hate people like me, they hate me. And I just, I just want to give them a different side and be like, hey, not all pastors are, are like this. You know, my, my whole thing, I want to catch you. I'll let the Holy Spirit clean you. I'm not going to tell you what you can do and what you can't do. Um, now, there's that aspect where you do, where there's teaching and there's training and there's different. But I don't want you to come in here thinking that that's my goal. I want you to come in here um, and I want you to fall in love with Jesus. And I want you to meet your creator. And I want, I want you guys to be begin this relationship with one another. And I'm not out to get you to look like me, smell like me, dress like me, talk like me. That's not my goal. I want you to fall in love with the person that I fell in love with. And that's Jesus Christ. And, I, and once you do, you can't know Jesus and not change. So that, that takes place. But I think for, for me and my wife, we decided, you know, we want to go out there and, and we want to catch people. And, and certainly the loss too. But there's a, lot of, there's a lot of runaways out there. And it's just like, I want the runaways too. You know, and sometimes they're the hardest. They have their walls up and they're guarded. But I think that, uh, man, they need, they need it. They need that body of Christ to surround them. And uh, really when they leave church kind of angry, what they're leaving is a family. And it's just like, you know, no different than a family runaway. You know, where's your brother? Where's your son? Where's your dad? Oh, they just, they're gone. And, you know, they're missing something. They're missing family. And I think mm -hmm. for us, we're just like, they need that family. Because when you're surrounded by that family and loved on by a family and wanted by a family, and I, I, think, it, I think it changes the way that we do Christianity. Mm -hmm. Now, you, you, you spoke to me earlier about this uh, this relationship that you have with the Lord. And obviously this relationship is birthed out of a deep love affair with the gospel. Mm -hmm. um, and it's even prompted you to consider organizing these thoughts in the form of a book. Tell us a little bit about your thinking on that book. Well, I, I feel like God told me to write a book. And, uh, and, I, and, I don't, and I use that term loosely, God told me. I really, I felt in my heart that I needed to write some of this stuff down and really just, that way I could just show other people how I feel. And, uh, because it's not all the time you get to do stuff like this. So mm -hmm. if I could just write in a book and it could be sitting on somebody's shelves and I don't know when they're going to read it a year from now, five years from now, but they're, they're going to pick it up. And, and, um, and my heart for this book was, is this, um, don't plant another church, plant the gospel. Because I was sitting one day and I was just kind of complaining to God about different church things like building stuff, money stuff. And, and I, was just, I was just going on and on and on. And I felt like God said, I never told you to plant a church. I told you to plant the gospel. And I said, well, you did tell me to plant a church. And he said, I know I told you to plant a church, but what, my goal was for you to plant the gospel. You let me take care of this stuff. I want you to do this right here, plant the gospel, because that's the only thing that's going to change people. Your expensive window or, you know, your pulpits and all that stuff, like that's, that's, not, going to, that's not going to change anybody's life. I want my house to look nice but I really want you to focus on planting the gospel and you're, you're less focused on that and more focused on, on the building. And, and when, when God started beginning to speak that to me, uh, I was just like, wow, you know, it kind of changed the way that I looked at people, changed the way that I looked at what I was doing. And uh, I was like, wow, my goal right here is to plant the gospel, you know? So here I am in a community and I'm focused on the church aspect, our church in the community. And God's saying, what, what's keeping you from planting the gospel? at Walmart? What's keeping you from planting the gospel at the grocery store, at the gas station, or at the ballpark? Let your church be the church, but don't, don't, don't try to win people over to me just to get them to your church. I told you to plant the gospel. So whether or not that church exists, Blake, you need to be planting the gospel. I don't care if you're in Kentucky or if you're in Orlando, Florida, you're, I want you to plant the gospel everywhere you go. 
be focused on planning the gospel. I'll take care of the church, but this is exactly what I want you to do. So I'm basically just going through there, looking at the life of Jesus and showing where he, this is, this is where Jesus was planting the gospel when he walked up at the pool of Bethesda and he healed, healed the man laying there, you know, like he was planting the gospel. And later on, you see the church come into play. But if you look at Jesus' life, Jesus was about planting the gospel. Now help so. people uh, unpack the word uh, because uh, in, in churches, as you know, we, we speak so much in churchianity. Yeah. And um, uh, unpack that word gospel. What, what is contained in that word gospel beyond salvation when you, mm. when you speak about the gospel? When, so when I, when I refer to the gospel, um, it's really, uh, we know in scripture it's the only thing that has the power, you know, to, to, to save people. And, and when, when I speak of the gospel, when I go tell the gospel to somebody, I'm going to start from the beginning. I'm going to tell them about how uh, in the beginning there was God, and God created the heavens and the earth. And I'm going I'm to work my way down through there. But I think the main meat of the gospel is the life of Jesus Christ. And uh, it's the, here's a, here's a perfect God came down in the, in the form of flesh and he dwelt among us. And he, this man lived a sinless life. And, and so I'm going to start there. And I want to talk about the deity of Jesus, but I want to get into the humanity side of Jesus too and how he lived and dwelt among us and he lived a sin-free life and he died a brutal death on a cross and he died and three days later rose again. And, and not only did he just raise from the dead and, and claim victory for himself, but he claimed victory for us too. And then he even told the disciples when he left, he said, look, he said, where I'm going, you cannot go, but I'm going to send a comforter. He's going to lead you and guide you into all truth. And so when, when we speak of that and I say, now we got the Holy Spirit living on the inside of us. And so I don't think that you could tell just the gospel story without adding that part in. So for me, it's that. So it's the life of Jesus Christ. And it doesn't end when Jesus rose again from the grave and uh, went to be with his father, I think now we have Christ in you, the hope of glory. So this is still the gospel. We're getting to live out the gospel, the, the going telling of the gospel, going and talking about Jesus. You know, I was preaching Sunday, um, the difference, everybody keeps saying, you know, these grace preachers, these grace preachers, these grace preachers, and I'm very much a grace preacher, but they say, you got to preach truth too. And I was like, well, let's break this down. What you're calling grace is actually mercy. You know, when somebody comes to me in sin and when somebody comes to me and they're broken down and they really need um, some, some lifted up, some lifting up, maybe they need some counsel, maybe they need some correction, but what I show them is mercy. You know, grace is unmerited favor. This, those are things like salvation. You know, we get, God blesses us even when we don't deserve it, but he shows us mercy. He shows us mercy. And even when we don't deserve it, he shows us mercy. And, you know, what we're calling truth is the same things that the Pharisees talked about. That's not what truth is. The truth is the gospel. The truth is Jesus. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. That's truth. So when you're talking about Jesus and when you're preaching Jesus, you're preaching truth. But everybody seems to mistake those two, and they want you to really preach the law and call that truth. And I say, well, Jesus looked at the Pharisees and said, there's no truth in you. But they knew the law. Jesus was looking at the heart, and he said, man, you don't, you don't look nothing like the father. He said, if your father was, he said, if your father was really Abraham, you wouldn't want to kill me. And this, this is where he turns around and looks at them and says, you're like your father, the devil. He said, because if, I, if Abraham was your father, you wouldn't want to kill me. And he says, more importantly, if God was your father, you wouldn't want to kill me. He said, but since you do, you're like your father, who was a murderer from the beginning. But they knew the law. They knew what the church is, quote, unquote, calling truth these days. So I say, you know, let's put grace back where it is. Grace is unmerited favor. That is a free gift. We get that, and there's no way around that. So it's okay to preach that. But it's, there's, no, there's nothing wrong with being a merciful person. Jesus was full of compassion. He was full of mercy, and he showed it everywhere he went. I mean, show me a story in the Bible where he wasn't showing mercy except for when he was dealing with Pharisees, the self-righteous. I think Jesus dealt real sternly with the self-righteous. But, man, it just seemed like with, with, with people, man, he was just always so merciful and compassionate. Yeah, the end goal, he walks, he looks right at him and says, now go and sin no more. Why? Because I've given you the, the life, the light of life now. You have life in you. You're no longer alienated from life because of what I've done for you. So I'm all about that gospel. And I, and I think sometimes when you tell people, don't do, don't do, don't do, don't do, that to me, that's not the gospel. Yeah, yeah. let me ask you this, um, just because uh, to help, you, help the audience get, okay. have, have some clarity yeah. on this. Um, sometimes when people use the word truth, they're talking about the do's and don'ts. Mm -hmm. Sometimes when they use the word truth, uh, talking about um, uh, 
their challenge with um, what some may call the hyper grace yeah. uh, view is a lack of obedience or a lack of follow through with what God has deposited yeah. so that we can, so to speak, profess one thing but live a different way. Yeah. And yet God probably wants, or doesn't probably, he wants one person in one body. Yeah. That what we say we, yeah. we, we believe and we adhere to, we do. In fact, even in, in you know, uh, John 15 where he says, if you love me, yep. you'll obey me. Yep. And so um, how do you help that person that's coming from being hurt in, in former churches? Yeah. Um, so they're totally disgusted with either hypocrisy or disgusted yeah. with the, the, the rules. Mm -hmm. uh, to realize that, that grace is also the power of God yeah. to live a highly effective life sure. um, that is obedience, but not so much obedience to the nitpickety things of the church, yeah. but obedience to the to call, the call yeah. of Christ. So I, I think for us, when, when dealing with people that are kind of disenfranchised from church, you have to, I think you have to be direct with them, loving in every kind of way, but also show them the, the silliness of what they're saying. So I don't go to church no more because it's full of hypocrites. It's like saying I don't go to the gym because it's full of out of shape people. That's why they're there. That's why you know? they're there. And, and, and as far as, as, far as the, the hypocrites go, like, what better place for them to be? What better place for the liars to be? What better place for the drunks to be? What better place than, than church to hear the gospel? And I think once you get to this point where they're making this decision, okay, how do I go from, you know, because people just say the super hyper grace, and I would say that you don't get any more super hyper than Jesus Christ coming and dying a brutal death on our behalf. You don't get much more super than that. But to what you're saying, because you hear it a lot and it says, you know, Jesus did say, if you love me, you obey my commandments. It's almost uh, that simple. Let me, let, we have about a minute left. Okay. Um, do you mind praying for our audience that has been hurt in their heart? We no, have no, about no. a minute. and Let's just take that minute and really pray for yeah. them uh, that there are answers in the gospel. There is. Um, this gospel that you're proclaiming. Yeah, let's do it. Let's okay. do it. I wanna, I'm going to pray for you right here. Uh, God, we just thank you so much. Um, uh, for the church, God, that we get to be a part of, that we get to pastor, that we get to uh, oversee, that we get to lead. Uh, but God, I, I just know that there's some people out there that are kind of tired of the church. They're turned off by the church. And, uh, and God, it's not your rules that people are turned off by. It's, it's not your commands that you give us, God, because you give us perfect commands. The Holy Spirit doesn't lead us in any direction but a good direction. So you're not a, a bad, evil person sitting up there on a, on a terrible throne, God, but you're, you're on a throne of mercy and you're on a throne of grace, God, and, and, and you're not a bad God. You're a good Father, and you want to lead us uh, into all truth and into righteousness, God. So, God, I just pray for that person that is sitting out there that is kind of unchurched or dechurched or disenfranchised with the church. And, God, I just pray, Lord, that you just, you just show them that, that you have unconditional love for them, that, um, that you love them more than life itself, God, that, that you died for them, that they might um, get to, 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 to be with you forever and eternity. God, there was a double imputation. We imputed to you our sin, and you in, imputed to us uh, your righteousness. So, God, show them that, um, that, that your ways are better that your ways are higher. And God, I just pray and that, um, that they're able to forgive maybe pastors that have kind of mismanaged them or kind of dealt with them harshly or, or uh, maybe just completely did wrong by them. God, help them to forgive those pastors and let them know that, that you're the chief shepherd, um, that there are people out there that kind of mess up your plans, but God, that you do have a perfect plan in sight and that you're good. God, we love you and we just thank you for who you are and draw those people back in in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you so much for being with us. We appreciate right. it. Enjoy it. you. This program has been brought to you through the prayers and contributions of our faithful partners throughout North America and the world.